Um, I know about your work uh, quite a bit. So, um, and, and I think we are really um, honored to have you to give a talk because uh, as, a, as a computational modeling person who also thinks about experiments very deeply and tries to make a very close connection between predictions and, and things that can be accomplished through experiments, uh, I think it will provide a great insight for the students on the call today that how we could utilize this uh, synergistic tool of computation and modeling combined with some innovative ideas to discover and develop new generation of materials. Um, also, I think it's, uh, it's amazing how you arrange and present stuff. So hopefully this will inspire students to see how, how information can be presented in a, in a very convenient manner that it allows people to understand and gain insights. So, so thanks so much for taking out the time. It's a great pleasure to have you and uh, welcome. Now yeah. I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sachin, for the kind introduction. You, you, you set the bar very high, high. I hope I will not disappoint uh, anybody. And I, I, I'm very thankful also to, to Sadi for organizing this uh, PAC uh, online uh, seminar. Uh, so yeah, so as Sachin uh, mentioned, um, what I would like to do today is to tell you about how you can use computations, predictive computation, in order to accelerate the discovery and the testing of material for specific applications. So my lab is interested in several areas in the field of energy conversion and storage. Today, I'm going to focus more specifically on the uh, problem of uh, providing sustainable fuels for the transportation sector. So uh, before I jump into that, uh, uh, I thank you again for, for attending. And I would like to give a broad perspective of why we uh, focus on this research. And one of the key motivation is related uh, to uh, the need to provide um, fuels for the transportation sector. And uh, here, as an introduction, a graph of the consumption as a function of, of time based on data from the US Energy Information Administration. And what you can see here is that there are essentially two contributions that are uh, very large. So 25 uh, millions of barrels per day of gasoline are used by light duty vehicles that you can see here. And you can see that the trend over time uh, has been uh, stabilized and is predicted to be uh, stable for the next few years. And this is because of progress in energy efficiency. Obviously, the car that we have now are more efficient than the cars that we used to have. Uh, and also uh, the development of new technologies hybrid vehicles since the 2000s, plug-in electric vehicles uh, since uh, 2010. And those have enabled us to make that uh, technological transition towards electrification that enable us to have an essentially stable consumption in the light duty fleet. But there is also this blue consumption that you see represent at least 40% of the current consumption and keeps growing over time. That is the consumption due to heavy duty vehicles. And as you know, it is much more complicated to develop hybrid uh, uh, heavy duty trucks and hybrid uh, and plug-in uh, electric uh, trucks. And as a result of that, you see that we don't have right now a good way to stabilize the consumption of uh, fuel for heavy duty vehicles. And so this is not a sustainable way to run the transportation sector. And we need to uh, provide fuels in the foreseeable future to uh, ful fulfill the needs of those heavy duty uh, vehicles such as truck, airplanes, uh, ships, etc. One option uh, uh, whereby you can um, do this is uh, by um, using fuel cells. So you have here the picture of a fuel cell car that you might have seen uh, online or in the news. It's the Toyota Mirai. Mirai uh, means a uh, future in Japanese, meaning that this is what Toyota feel could be a significant contributor to the future of the transportation, transportation sector. It's a fuel cell car that takes hydrogen as a fuel, and the only uh, byproduct of the production of electricity uh, will be uh, vapor, uh, water vapor. So it means that if you run this vehicle, you are absolutely not polluting, and this is very advantageous for the point of view of uh, sustainability. The other advantage is that this type of vehicle is very efficient, on average, twice as efficient as an internal combustion engine. And so as a result, 
it uh, has uh, also a benefit from the point of view of the energy consumption. But the bad surprise, uh, if you're the owner of one of those cars, what, the first time you will go to the gas station, you will see that the cost of your hydrogen is about six times more expensive than the cost of regular gasoline for, a, for the similar energy content. And as a result, uh, this is something that has to be heavily su subsidized. And uh, this is a, a key roadblock for the adoption of this type of vehicles. Another disadvantage is that the hydrogen that you have is made by the process that is called steam reforming. So you take methane and you uh, uh, extract from those the hydrogen to produce dihydrogen. And as a result of this, uh, this energy uh, uh, intensive process is also detrimental because it produces CO2 as a byproduct of the reforming of the, of the, of the methane. So we really need to find ways to uh, develop um, sustainable production of hydrogen that will not rely on steam reforming and that will have a cost that will be competitive with uh, gasoline that we use in the internal combustion engine. One way uh, to address this, um, this um, uh, question is uh, through photocatalysis. So you have here two concepts of photocatalytic uh, processes in order to produce hydrogen. In the first one, you have uh, baggies. So these are large bags uh, on the order of 10 meters in which uh, you put suspensions of those uh, particles that are photocatalytic, meaning that they can absorb light and one of the components of those photocatalysts on the nanometer scale, micrometer scale, is a, a, a water reducing agent. So essentially, it can reduce the protons into hydrogen. And on the other side, you have the uh, photocatalytic oxidation of water into oxygen. So this is one of the concepts that you can use to absorb sunlight, produce hydrogen by splitting water into oxygen and H2. Uh, the other concept is this dual bed particle suspension in which you essentially do the same thing, but you separate the two reactions in separate chambers, in separate baggies, and all of this is connected by a redox mediator, the A component here, that navigates from the right side, from the left side to the left side in order to uh, mediate the transport of the charge carriers. So there's been a lot of analysis of this type of um, technological solution. In particular, there is this very nice paper published in Energy and Environmental Science 2013 that goes really into the technical uh, economic feasibility of this type of technologies. And they concluded that if you were to achieve an efficiency STH, solar to uh, hydrogen efficiency of 10%, that is the current threshold uh, for this type of technology, you'll be able to uh, bring down the cost of producing hydrogen to two to four dollar per gallon of gasoline equivalent and at that point it will be competitive with regular gasoline the caveat with all of that is that we don't have right now materials that can achieve this type of efficiency and it is a challenge for the community theoretical and uh, experimental to be able to develop those type of materials that will be stable and that will be uh, scalable uh, uh, in terms of uh, production at a global scale so this is where we wanted to uh, see if we can use some of the uh, most advanced techniques in the computational, at the computational level in order to predict uh, what type of material could be beneficial for this type of conversion. And uh, we use uh, here high throughput computational material discovery that is a, uh, uh, the ability uh, nowadays to use computer predictions in order to predict many of the uh, important properties of material before they are made. And you can see here that these high throughput computational techniques have been used in many uh, different fields from battery engineering, the design of electrocatalysts, solar cells, thermoelectrics, as well as uh, piezoelectric and dielectric. And you can see that there has been a lot of activity in terms of computational publication in that area in the past uh, 20 years. The caveat, however, is that if you look carefully at those data, you see that only a small fraction on the order of 20% of those publications are validated by experiments. So a lot of people do a lot of calculations, uh, but very rarely are those calculations 
really uh, connected to experiments in order to validate and improve the predictive ability of those computational techniques. So it was for us uh, an important question to uh, really uh, connect experiment and theory in order to achieve uh, what we call a co-validation of uh, the theoretical prediction against experiment and to accelerate the data-driven discovery of new material for, for photocatalysis. So you have here the schematics of the protocol that we have uh, developed. So it's really a collaborative approach that involves predictive calculations and experimental synthesis, uh, characterization, and testing, whereby in the first step, we uh, go in the computer and we calculate the chemical stability of the material. So we want the material to be stable. You want the uh, enthalpy of formation to be negative. Then uh, what we can do also using those same technique, we can solve uh, the equation of quantum mechanics and understand the interaction of light with our material in order to predict band gaps and determine whether this material would be compatible with the solar spectrum. After this, an important question is to see whether uh, the redox potential of your semiconductor are going to be aligned with the redox potential of water. So essentially, the question that we ask here is, is the exiting energy of an electron from the semiconductor higher than the entering energy of that electron uh, in, the, in, in the surrounding water solvent. And on, on the other side, we want to make sure that the exiting energy of a hole that is photogenerated is uh, lower than the entering energy of that hole in the water solvent. Once we have determined that computationally, we go and we ask experts about the toxicity of the material. We make sure that the material is uh, earth abundant. We check the synthesizability of the material by reviewing the experimental literature. So we want to make sure that there is at least one instance in the literature where that material has been made. And then we go and we refine our calculation. And I'm going to talk about this uh, in a moment. We go from the uh, original DFT calculation, density functional theory, to DFT plus U calculations in order to predict the band gap more accurately. And I'm going to uh, go back to that uh, in the next slides. And after that, we uh, synthesize the material. Uh, our colleagues synthesize them, check the phase purity by XRD, uh, X-ray uh, diffraction. And then we go and we do uh, the much short key measurement and the uh, testing of the photocatalytic activity of the material. And once this is done, we, we learned a lot and we can go back to the cycle and refine our calculation, refine our experimental techniques and come up with a, a new list of candidates uh, for uh, the photocatalytic conversion of hydrogen, of water into hydrogen. So what I'm going to do now is to focus on two main problems. The first one is the how to calculate accurate band gaps. And I'm going to describe a bit more the techniques that we use for that. That is really a specificity of the work that we, uh, that we have done here. And then I'm going to talk about how we can make materials and check their phase purity before uh, I tell you about the final results of this type of, of uh, co-validated theoretical and experimental study. So first, the uh, prediction of the band gap with accurate, high accuracy. I'm going to tell you about this problem and how we, we address it. So the technique that we use uh, in order to uh, predict the band gap is uh, density functional theory. That is a method that uh, enables you to simplify the red equation into this blue equation. So the red equation is the many body Schrodinger equation that involves this capital H, that is the many body Hamiltonian, that really tries to keep track of all of the interactions between pairs of electrons at the same time. So this uh, object uh, is important because it embeds all of the interaction between the electrons. Unfortunately, uh, this is a very complicated uh, equation to solve, and we need to find ways to simplify uh, the complexity of this um, uh, uh, equation. And the method that we use here is a method that is called density functional theory, in which you substitute this complex many-body Hamiltonian with a one-body Hamiltonian that depends on the charge density of the system. So what you do in this density functional theory uh, technique you start from some initial charge density. You build the electron-electron interaction 
by using a mean field description of the interaction on the uh, electrons. So the mean field potential is built from the total charge density. From that, you will calculate the orbitals by solving the one body Schrodinger equation. And once you have the new orbital, you recalculate the charge density by taking the square of the orbitals. You calculate the effective interaction, the Hamiltonian. You calculate in the orbital, and you do this loop until you converge to uh, some uh, uh, final result. The caveat with this type of technique is that, the, as I said, the effective interaction is built on the total charge density. And it means uh, that each of the electrons that you have here is going to feel its own interaction because each electron contributes to the total charge density and the total charge density is used in order to build the effective potential. And as a result of this, there is this phenomenon that we call self-interaction. It's a unphysical phenomenon whereby an electron will feel its own potential through its contribution to the total charge density. And as a result of that, the electron will be unstable. It will self-repair because it feels, it feels its own influence. And uh, the, the consequence of this is shown here. Uh, you see that in DFT, if you use this method DFT, the computed band gap is going to be uh, smaller than the experimental band gap because in DFT, it is too easy to excite an electron because the electron is destabilized by its own influence in the first place. So one way in which you can address this um, problem is by introducing a refined description of the uh, effective uh, potential. Instead of building the effective Hamiltonian based on the charge density, you can build it on the charge density, but also based on the uh, orbital, the wave function on which you apply the effective potential. And as a result, you can see that you can remove that self-interaction effect. The electron is not destabilized anymore, and you get a much better match between the computed band gap and the experimental band gap. So this is an important technique in order to address some of the limitation of the uh, DFT uh, method in blue uh, using a refined description of the interactions between the electron that go beyond the mean field approximation uh, in gray. The, the caveat with that is that this is extremely expensive. It's a, a method that is constitutionally demanding because each electron has a different interaction potential. And as a result, you will need to uh, calculate different potential for each of those electrons. And that tends to be computationally demanding. One uh, way in which you can address this issue is by uh, introducing a simplification that consists not of taking into account the entire orbital in building the Hamiltonian, by taking into account the symmetry of the orbital. So essentially, the s orbitals will have a potential that is different from the p orbital, that is different from the d orbital, and that is different for the f orbital. So each angular momentum channel will have a different type of potential that describe them uh, specifically. And as a result of that, you get a much more efficient technique, and uh, you have the potential to address some of the limitation of the blue method, the DFT method. So this method is called DFT plus U. It's totally non-empirical. It's uh, something that you can apply based solely on the knowledge of the chemical formula of the material. And it's a method that was implemented recently and that we have used in the context of this project. So using this unique technique, we were able to calculate band gaps. And I show here uh, the result of the uh, blue method, the original method, the one, the one that includes self-interaction. As you can see here, I plot the conduction band as a function of the valence band. So you want the conduction band to be lower than zero in order to be able to catalyze the reduction of water. And you want the valence band to be higher than 1.23 electron volt corresponding to the redox potential of water oxidation. So you want to be in the lower uh, right quadrant of this diagram. And you also want to be solar compatible. So you want to be able to absorb solar light. So here, this is the visible spectrum in this region. So you want to be in this uh, colored region in order to have a good photocatalyst. So as you can see, uh, if you apply the vanilla DFT, the, the standard DFT technique, you will think that many of those materials will not absorb the solar spectrum and they will not be uh, inside that color region that is the target in order to get a potential photocatalyst. But the moment you turn, up this, you turn on the 
uh, angular momentum specificity. So you have now this gray potential that I've shown previously in which you build the interaction, not only on the charge density, but also on the symmetry of the orbital. You get much better prediction of the uh, band gap. And you see that many of the materials that we had are now in the desirable uh, region for water splitting. So I'm going to uh, show next uh, what are the, those materials, and I'm going to discuss this a bit more. But before doing so, I, I'd like to talk about the other issue that we have to, to deal with, how we can be sure that we can make those compounds and how we can check their phase purity. So uh, this is uh, the list of compounds that we had. So we yeah, have about... Where's my... Yes, where's sorry my about this. Where's my Decepticon? Where's my Decepticon? Oh, I think it's upstairs. OK, sorry. So this is what I was... This is... Sorry, so this is what I was mentioning previously. These are the joy of uh, parenting. Um, so uh, this was Issa, my, my, one of the two twins uh, here. Uh, so yeah, so, so we screened uh, 2,000 compounds based on a criteria of stability, solar compatibility, as well as um, uh, compatibility in terms of redox potentials. And you can see here that uh, uh, those compounds uh, are uh, screened uh, through the literature. And we wanted for each of those compounds to check whether they have been made previously. And so for that, we turned to our colleague Reshak in chemistry, who is an expert in inorganic solid state uh, synthesis. And uh, he went through the heroic task. So it's a very uh, demanding task of going through the literature and checking for those 2,000 compounds, which one have been made and which one have not been made yet uh, in the literature. So this was an important step in the screening to make sure that what we predict can actually be realized experimentally. And, you, and they assembled this type of table. So this is just a, a portion of this table. It's a long table uh, that uh, tells us for each of the compound how they can be uh, realized synthetic in the lab. And so uh, for some of them, you can see, for example, for this now beyond bromine, uh, you can just purchase it. Some of their compound can be made by idle thermal furnace, um, uh, idle thermal synthesis. And for some other, you, you see that you need more advanced techniques such as chemical vapor de deposition with a specific thermal gradient in order to achieve this indium bismuth uh, uh, sulfur, sulfide material. So based on this, we were confident that we could achieve experimentally those materials. And we can move to the next task of actually uh, checking their phase purities. So for that, our colleague uh, went to uh, X-ray uh, diffraction um, 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 uh, setup, in which uh, the, for each of the material, they looked at the um, X-ray uh, diffraction pattern. So you, you send an X-ray on the material, and you monitor the signature that you obtain uh, through that um, uh, uh, probe. And you can see that for most of the material that we have, we have a very good correspondence between the predicted uh, X-ray signature and the experimental uh, X-ray pattern. So you can see that for most of them, the peaks are matching uh, very closely, except maybe for this um, uh, sodium ferrite, where you can see that there is uh, some wiggles uh, in, in between that correspond to the appearance of a secondary phase. So the part of the, phase, the sample is amorphous. And as a result of this, you can see those wiggles in the, um, the X-ray pattern. But overall, you can see that there is an excellent uh, close correspondence between experiment and theory in terms of X-ray patterns, meaning that the compounds that were made are uh, actually uh, phase pure. So based on this, uh, I, I can now uh, summarize uh, the entire protocol. So we started from 70,000 compounds from the materials project. So this is a huge database that is of uh, very uh, uh, high benefit to the community, where, have, where you have um, a list, a comprehensive list of a lot of inorganic compounds. And uh, you uh, first go and you check the stability of those compounds using uh, the criteria of the entropy of formation that has to be negative. Then we use the uh, first DFT technique, the blue technique, the one that does not include the specificity in terms of the angular momentum. And you uh, want to make sure that the band gap will be uh, suitable 
for uh, solar absorption, taking into account that those techniques tend to uh, underestimate the band gap. And as a result of this, we shift slightly the, the water spectrum, the, the, the solar spectrum, in order to account from, for this underestimation of the band gap. And then the next step is to check the redox potentials of the uh, compound, the valence band and the conduction band, in order to uh, be able to achieve uh, water splitting. The next step is to look at LD50, so the lethal dose of your material, to make sure that it is safe from a health point of view. Uh, and then uh, the, the arse abundance is uh, inspected. We want to make sure that we don't use materials that are uh, non-earth abundant and expensive, such as gold and platinum. This is where then, based on those 2000 materials, we do the literature search to make sure that they can be synthesized. And then we use the refined DFT calculation that includes information about the angular momentum of the orbitals in order to have a more specific description of the electron-electron interaction that enables us then to calculate refined band gaps and refined redox potential. And at that point, we check the phase purity and we obtain 14 compounds that we can test uh, experimentally. So in terms of those tests now, uh, the first test that we do uh, is to take the powders. So you can see the, the powder that we have synthesized and that we, we know are phase pure. And we uh, look at their optical absorption. So we plot the optical absor absorption times the uh, energy of the incident photon rescaled. Uh, and we obtain those talk plots that enable us to extract the value of the band gap by uh, extrapolating the linear portion of those uh, spectra. And you can see that for most of the compound, the signature is pretty clear. We can determine accurately the band gap, except maybe for some of them that contain um, uh, potentially a mid gap state that create some additional peaks uh, in the um, uh, band gap region of the, of the material. So except for those, uh, we uh, most of the time obtain a very clear sign signature that enable us to determine the band gap without uh, uh, too much ambiguity except for those compounds here that uh, I, will, I will detail uh, on the next slide. So then we can compare our computational band gap to the experimental band gap. Uh, we uh, separate here the data into two families, the materials that are uh, non-magnetic, essentially that do not contain iron, cobalt, or other uh, magnetic elements, and the other ones that are uh, open shell transition metal that tend to adopt variable tr uh, oxidation state. And as a result of that, uh, they uh, will tend to uh, uh, facilitate the incorporation of mid-gap mid states. So as you can see here, um, for the non-magnetic material, we tend to be fairly well. So for this barium ortho plumbate, copper plumbate, up to the calcium indate, which have a higher band gap, we do fairly well in predicting the band gap. And so we can move confidently with the screening. Uh, but for the non-magnetic, the magnetic material that contain those compounds with variable oxidation state and with magnetic order, we tend to not be as accurate in terms of the predictions of the uh, of the band gap. We tend to overestimate the band gap, whereby if you were to include magnetic order, you will most likely have band gap that are much smaller than what we have here. And this is because when you shift the 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 spin up and spin up down band you will uh, have a lower band gap if you have some kind of a shift between the two uh, magnetic uh, moments. So uh, based on this, we this is an important conclusion. And we, we know that for magnetic material, we need more work. But at least for the non-magnetic materials, such as those orthoplombate and those uh, indate and uh, antimonate, uh, we can be confident that um, we have a good prediction of the band gap. So we move on, and now we look at their redox potential. So in blue, you have the simulated calculated redox potentials. And in orange are the redox potential that are obtained by much of key analysis. So these are experiments that were done by taking the powder and drop casting them onto transparent films and uh, performing a capacitive measurement to extract the value of the flat band potential, so the redox potential and uh, in the middle of the, of, of the range, from which we can then calculate the position of the top and the bottom band. So this, those experiments were done at NREL. So these are uh, experimental experiments that are delicate. And we uh, were fortunate to be able to have access to 
facilities at the National Renewable Energy Lab to be able to uh, perform those measurements. So as you can see, if you compare the blue simulations to the orange uh, um, result, uh, we do uh, quite well, except maybe for some of those compounds, you can see that you have a systematic uh, cathodic shift, uh, meaning that the potential is more reducing than expected for uh, some of those compounds, especially for this magnesium antimonate. And we uh, uh, suspect that this is due to the appearance of uh, oxygen vacancies at the surface that will tend to push up uh, the, the redox potential compared to uh, what you would predict uh, in the computer if you don't take into account the possibility of those oxygen vacancies. But overall, you can see that we have um, a fairly uh, interesting agreement between experiment and theory to the point that we can use our calculation most of the time to confidently um, determine whether a material will have suitable redox potential for the uh, catalytic reduction of, of water and the catalytic oxidation of water into oxygen. So based on this, uh, we then move on to the next uh, step. That is the, the really important test to check whether uh, you can uh, detect hydrogen when you illuminate those compounds uh, in water with, uh, with, with, with light. And so for that, um, our colleagues, Venkat Goparan and Hugo Wang, his student, developed a very sensitive gas chromatography uh, setup. So you put here your reaction cell and with your sample, and you have a series of uh, valves that you can open and close in order to ensure that you seal correctly uh, the, the chamber and the gas chromatographer. And then you can purge uh, this entire setup in order to make sure that you don't have any leftover hydrogen uh, in order to carry out your experiment. So these are the different modes of operation of this uh, gas chromatography setup. So it's a unique uh, capability that was developed by Hugo Wang, and that was critical for the accurate measurement of the uh, 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 production of hydrogen. So based on this, we were able to perform experiments. So these are typical gas chromatography spectra that we obtain uh, through those, uh, uh, with this setup. And you can see that for many of the compounds that we that we have, we do de detect hydrogen. So we're very pleased to, to see that the productions uh, that we made uh, yield material that are efficient uh, for the hydrogen uh, production. For some of them, uh, we don't didn't see uh, those peaks, and especially for this manganese antimonate that I have singled out previously, it's the one that had a large shift in the redox potential, pro potentially due to the appearance of oxygen vacancies. And so we're not surprised to see that this one uh, will not produce hydrogen. And the same uh, holds for the barium indate that also had a significant shift in the uh, redox potential. So with that, we, we feel we have a conclusive uh, uh, first uh, set of results that, that shows that if you combine experiment and theory, and if you uh, are careful about the way you solve the uh, equation of quantum mechanics taking into account the electron-electron interaction in a, in a refined way. And if you uh, check the uh, existence of magnetic order, you can uh, computationally and experimentally discover a new photocatalyst. And in particular, this calcium plumbate and barium plumbate had not been uh, previously reported in the literature. So we submitted this paper in Energy and Environmental Science, and it should appear soon uh, in, in, that, in that journal. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude, and I hope that I've stimulated your interest uh, in this um, uh, type of uh, computational capability, whereby you uh, take uh, DFT, density functional theory, refine it to uh, better predict the electron interaction, and uh, are able uh, to uh, calculate the solar absorption and band alignment, and then combine this with uh, experimental capability of synthesis, characterization, and testing in order to uh, perform an accelerated uh, design of material for photocatalysis. So right now we're doing another uh, step of this cycle. Uh, so based on what we have learned, we, we are performing right now another uh, cycle of this iteration. And we're discovering interesting materials that are based on, on copper. And, and we feel that those could be very interesting uh, for the point of view of uh, producing hydrogen. So, so with that, I'd like to, to conclude. 
Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the people without whom this work would not have been possible. So uh, Hugo Wang is the one that uh, performed the gas chromatography test. Monica uh, Thibault and Cathy Badding uh, did the work at NREL and, and also at, at Cornell, uh, testing the alignment of the bent edges. Quinn Campbell, uh, uh, um, Nicole uh, Kirchner, Vincent uh, Wang uh, worked with Megan Penrod, Wayne, and uh, Steve Baska in order to calculate uh, the, the bend gap and perform the calculation using the, the advanced DFT technique that I've just described. And I would like to thank all of my collaborators at Penn State, Venkat Gopalan, Resh Shak, Senope uh, Asem uh, Alibi, uh, Hector Abruna, Craig Finney, and Betul Pamuk, who is a postdoc working with Craig Finney at uh, Cornell. And I would like to thank um, um, our collaborators at EPFL and Kyushu University. And all of this work would, have, would not have been possible without the support of the DMREF program of the NSF and uh, the DOE as part of the uh, Hadrogen uh, Consortium. So with that, I, I would like to thank you for your attention and, and I will be happy to answer the question that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Smila, for this great talk. We appreciate it. Um, thank you. So while uh, if folks you want to ask question, you can just raise your hand. I think it's a blue button to click on it or uh, just send the chat. So the, the smile on photocatalyst, I have a question about reusability. So um, <laughs> how long the catalyst lasts in the process? Like how do you determine uh, the reusability of this catalyst or number of cycles yeah that, that's a very important question that's a that's a very fair question so th the way we do it is after the photocatalytic test we do another a second xrd mm -hmm. and determine if the the sample uh, has the same diffraction pattern and so based on this we can see that for most of the sample if you run them under a standard ph condition they will be stable for those one uh, especially this um, um the iron, uh, the, the iron, this one, the iron mm -hmm. um, uh, ferrite, uh, this one will tend to uh, be stable uh, under acidic condition as well. So it's the, the one that was the most stable. Uh, the other one, um, the, they tend to degrade under acidic condition. So this is a test that we have to do afterwards. And this is another step that we plan to add to the screening. Uh, so it's something that we can check using Courbet diagram and that we can validate it experimentally. It seems like uh, lots of oxides appear in this simulation as uh, as photocatalyst, um, and and I was surprised to see like the crystal structures are also very different. So your perovskites like let tighten it, but you also have many different symmetries. So there's not like a trend that there's a particular type of crystal structure which appears as as consistent winner. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, so in the first step of the screening, uh, I think experimentally, the, the oxide were, were, were privileged because they are, it seems like they were simpler to make. I mean, I'm not an expert, but it looks like those were the most accessible based on solid state uh, synthesis. Uh, but, but in the second step of the screening, we have actually a lot of sulfide, mm -hmm. uh, calcogenide, uh, that we that we found and, and we are going after those uh, at this point. And uh, it's very interesting. A lot of them are, are based on cuprous ions and they tend to develop layer structures. Mm -hmm. So this this seems to be uh, um, a, a common uh, feature of the material that we have because the, those layer structure and this type of fabrication tend to lead to, it seems lower band gap yeah. than what you will have uh, if you if you didn't have this type of, of layering. So uh, even though structurally you're right, they, it appears they're not, they're, they're distinct. If you look closely, a lot of them are layered. Okay. And that, that's something that seems to be uh, interesting from the point of view of uh, material design. And uh, a lot of them are closed shell D10 or D0 transition metal. So that's also something that uh, emerged based on the study that we did. Excellent question, absolutely. 
Thanks, Mala. Questions from the audience? Oops. We have a lot of students on the call today, I can see. Yeah, you also had a, a very young student, my my son, that that yeah, jumped in. Yeah, future PhD student. <laughs> so, so yeah. they're two. Usually, they're, they're they come in pairs. So they're <laughs> they're correlated uh, kids. <laughs> they come in pairs. Uh, so uh, I, I will not be surprised if the second one comes in a, in a minute. <laughs> so if you wait long enough, you might see him. Now that's that's the fun part of it. Absolutely, yeah. To working, yeah, working in the family. So while while my uh, students are still thinking it seems like the question uh, it's not like if i can ask generally so in the perovskite community these uh, like organohalite perovskites or, or basically solar cell community uh, they continuously have a lot of interest in this water splitting or uh, mm -hmm. to design these uh, cells in and and try to show that they are better than all the other possible photocatalysts for water splitting uh, What's your take on water splitting? Like, what's the best uh, uh, catalyst or solar cell you have come across that you feel has really good promise for, mm, yeah, for basically generating yeah. hydrogen from water? Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, we're, we uh, are also very interested in uh, perovskites. And um, mm. it seems like for many of those, um, hybrid, organic, inorganic perovskite, the, the, the stability in water is, is probably the, the one of the key issues. So uh, those tend to lose their integrity, the structural integrity when you put them in water. So, so potentially they, they could be very interesting if you have a protective coating maybe mm -hmm. on with them. And um, uh, so for that, you will need to, to, to correctly align the energy levels and so that you have all an electron injection. So that, that could definitely be, uh, I believe, uh, uh, an area where computation and experiment could, could work together. Uh, in terms of what we have, we have seen uh, on our side, uh, we, we really, uh, we think that based on our finding material that evolve P block cations, like mm -hmm. antimony, bismuth, uh, indium, um, uh, as well as copper, uh, so all of those D10 um, um, cation that, that belong to the right part of the periodic table uh, seem to always give you band gaps that are um, pretty good for uh, as a starting point for absorbing solar light. So mm -hmm. if I have to put my bet, uh, I would put my bet in that direction and combining them with sulfur, selenium, uh, mm -hmm. seems to be good because the electronegative dif the electronegativity difference is lowered and because of the lower electronegativity difference between those p block cations and p block anions you tend to achieve band gaps that are lower than many of the white band gap semiconductors so mm -hmm. actually we're doing right now a, a more systematic systematic study of this family of compounds sounds great There's a question in the chat from alex um, she's asking, does photocatalysis require samples to be single crystal? Does this issue add issues in the synthesis? Does this add issues in synthesis if it's a single crystal? And thanks for your very fantastic talk. Thanks a lot, uh, Alex. So that's a very good question. So here we, we want it to be practical. So. The, all of the powders that we have are polycrystalline, so those powders here, mm -hmm. and we tested them as polycrystalline forms. So we do believe that having a single crystal will improve the photocatalytic activity because uh, you will have less electron hole recombination at those defect sites, and that will raise the catalytic performance. But uh, what we try to do here is to find something that will not require to be single crystalline and and um, uh, but this is definitely an important aspect to take into account and the more crystalline you are the the more likely we believe uh, you are to have a high photocurrent mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. so that, that, that's a good, very, very important remark indeed. Perfect. Any other questions from the audience? If not, then let's thank uh, Professor Dabo for taking out the time uh, one day before the Thanksgiving. So it's yeah, uh, <laughs> my pleasure. Thank, thank you thank so you much for... for taking out the time from your family to just yeah, get no, no. Thank, yeah. thank you very much for 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 the invitation. I, I really appreciate it. and thanks for the great question for the for the great feedback. Uh, all of that is is uh, is very beneficial, and uh, I'll be happy to discuss offline if any question uh, arises after that. So. Happy Turkey Day, happy Thanksgiving, and uh, uh, I wish you, you have a safe and, and pleasant time with your friend and your family.